How's everybody doing today? Yeah. That's awesome. That part where he was a fan favorite, I wrote that. <laughs> I have uh, I've been very fortunate to enjoy some unique successes throughout my life. As Paula said, um, I helped win a national championship at Pittsburgh State University. Uh, I played in Super Bowl 30. I don't remember the score. Um, <laughs> anybody get that one? Some people are sometimes curious about that. So this is the ring we got for that. So I always kind of hand it out. I'll, and you can just kind of hand it around if you want to take a look at it. I would love to get it back if possible. <laughs> On more than one of occasion, I have left and, miss, and people are like, Mr. Gammon, your ring. I was like, oh yeah, forgot. Been hitting the head too many times. Uh, but yeah, so I've, I've helped win a national championship, played in Super Bowl 30, and I was the first long snapper to be added to the roster in 2005. Um, but those are life events, along with some others that I'd like to share with you today. Uh, <coughs> They did not happen through mere chance or circumstance. Uh, we all have the ability to do great things, to lead a rewarding life. Uh, no doubt what I did was maybe a little bit more public than others, uh, but what I did to get there uh, was not exclusive to me. We all have this ability. Now, you might be thinking, but Kendall, I could never play in the NFL, and I would grant you that. That may be true. Uh, physical strengths and abilities are different for each and every one of us, but we can all work to develop our emotional strengths and our emotional abilities. Now, emotions are what drive us as human beings. When we're attentive to how they affect us both individually and collectively, our ability to succeed increases dramatically. That success, I believe, is directly proportional to the emotional strength you build, both in yourself and those you lead. If you focus purely on the physical, you eventually plateau and you never reach your full potential. Now, I'm not saying that we discount physical strengths. For me, it was essential. It's what got me into the NFL. I was a long snapper. Who knows what a long snapper is? Okay, who doesn't know what a long snapper is? Okay, and apparently there's some other people who don't care what a long snapper is. <laughs> and that's okay. You know, for 15 years, on punts, I snapped the ball 15 yards or less, and for field goals, eight yards or less. So. Uh, but has anybody heard me speak before? Or if you've read my book, my first book? Okay, if that's the case, then you're uh, exempted from this question. But we want to have a little fun, which is this. The ball that I snapped each and every time for 15 years on field goals rotated a certain amount of times. So just taking a guess, how many times do you think that ball rotated in those eight yards that it went back there? Not everybody at once. 20, 17, 35. Zero. Zero. Who said zero? Come up here, second. Is that right? What's your name? Amber. Amber. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet uh, Amber, you. it is not right. No. <laughs> but uh, it's like Price is Right. It's closest to and not over. Okay. So you're the closest. So the ball that I snapped uh, rotated exactly three and a half revolutions each and every time that I snapped it for 15 years. Do you wonder why that is? Laces out. Remember Ace Ventura? Laces out, Dan? I wanted to snap the ball so every time that they caught it, Amber, that they, they caught it with the laces out so that they could set it down and be ready there. They didn't want to have to spin it. That distracted the kicker. Or the other thing is that, you know, they didn't want to kick the laces because that, that made it not, not, that, uh, not that available to the success. I am not going to have you kick it. But you know what, I like that question. I've never had that question in the who knows how many years. So, so come over here with me. I just, let's have a little talk here. So uh, I, I mentioned that, uh, you can stay right there, that's good. I mentioned that, um, you know, right, a little bit more, look right there. You have so much power up here when you do this, you can just push them anywhere. But no, right there. Um, so the laces out part of, of things is basically facilitating the success of others. It's a, it's a hashtag world. And that laces out is what we're going to talk about first, which is how we facilitate the success of others. Now, I mentioned and Paula mentioned that I played in a Pro Bowl. And um, I was very fortunate that I was very proud of it. And it, it was really kind of nice because it allowed me to, to up my price um, uh, <laughs> autograph wise, which you know, was great. I mean, so I, I took the price to uh, five dollars, and I would just, you know, appreciate if everybody could respect that, because quite honestly, um, I can't afford to pay any more than that um, <laughs> to have somebody take my autograph. So, uh, with with that, I want to I want to have a little fun here. Amber, A M B E R. All right, we got a little bit of it pre-signed.
There you go. Thank Hope you, you enjoy your day. Hope you enjoy this and it's memorable. Take care. Right. You bet. Thank My you. pleasure. You bet. <laughs> That's always a lot of fun to do. You know what? And um, I, I like to start out that way because I want you to know that we're going to talk with each other today. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk at you or talk to you. We're going to talk with each other, and I want you not to be afraid to answer some things if you like. But we're going to start with his laces out, facilitating the success of others. Here at the hospital uh, and Freeman Health, you do that each and every day with the health of people. But you do it with your teams also. Everybody in here is a leader in, in some way, some shape, some form. And when we make it our priority to help others be successful, eventually it comes around to us. In what form? You know, that's to be determined. For me, I snapped a ball as fast and as accurately as I could for 15 years. I made the Pro Bowl my 14th year, or 13th year rather. But as I always say, with team success comes individual accolades. You know, throwing this ball between my legs for 15 years, I mean, as fast as and accurately as I can, I mean, only in America. It is a truly a be beautiful country, <laughs> for sure. So, we talked about that in the rot rotations. So, people often ask me, they're like, Kendall, you know, what you do is a long snapping. Um, th was there something that helped you get to where you are and, and helped you be able to snap? And, and, and actually, my answer to that is as unique <coughs> as snapping itself, which is this. <clears throat> I am a juggler. Who came to work today thinking they were going to see juggling? <laughs> Good. That would have hurt. I'm a juggler. I started juggling when I was in the eighth grade. I had cousins who juggled. I thought it was cool. And we went from there. I've juggled uh, nationally. I've competed in, in uh, international competitions. One was in Atlanta. I guess that's not international, but people came from all around. <laughs> and I got fourth. But you know, you know, I, I credit my juggling and what I've done all my life as not just having fun and being able to enjoy it, but really it helped my hand-eye coordination. Uh, they have done some studies actually that if you juggle uh, for at least three months and you keep doing it on a daily basis, the gray matter actually grows and more of your brain, brain becomes active. And then part of that study also is the fact that if you let it go back, your brain returns to its, its initial st uh, uh, state. So I guess, Paula, maybe you get some type of uh, juggling program going here. We'll, we'll see what go goes on. But as you maybe saw earlier, juggling is a passion of mine. I actually juggled center ring for Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Belly Circus not once but twice. For all you smart asses, I'm the one on the right. <laughs> so we've done clubs. So let's have some more fun. <clears throat> Rings. And there will be a test here a little bit later. So pay attention. That's all I'll ask. Did you see that? The, the, the colors? Nice? Yes, OK. Just making sure you got that. Absolutely. <laughs> you. Thank you. So I've done clubs, I've done rings, so naturally the next one is to do balls. <laughs> and, and really, I'm not just juggling for your own edification and enjoyment, although I know it's very high right now. <laughs> but there are some metaphors that we're going to come up with this, on this one. Okay, you know what, when I'm juggling, as I'm juggling, am I looking at all the balls or am I looking at you? I'm looking at you for the most part, right? Absolutely. You know, uh, juggling in general, people think it's very mesmerizing at times. And they'll, uh, oftentimes they'll come up and they'll say, you know what, that's so cool, but I could never juggle. And the fact is, everybody has the ability to juggle. To what degree, that's up for conjecture. But we all have a chance, or we have, all have the abilities to juggle. Now, the one thing that happens for those, and the common mistake they make when they can't juggle, is they only focus on one object as opposed to looking through those. You know, when I'm juggling, how many balls are in the air at one time and how many balls are in my hand? I always get answers all of a sudden because if you think I'm giving another ball away, <laughs> I understand that. Basically, when it, co when it comes down to it, there's one ball in the air at all times and there's two balls in my hand right there. And we think about that in your life, the three, different, the, the three different parts of your life, you know, your personal needs, your work, your kids. Those three things 
they kind of dominate our life. And there's no, there's no doubt about that. And what I'm trying to get at is the fact of at any one time, I'm looking through <coughs> the balls. I'm looking through the area of my life. But the fact, when we start to focus on everything at the same time, we, we look at the three parts of our life, our kids, our personal needs, our work. You know, life balance, again, we can strive for it, but I don't ultimately think that's what we can get to. You have to understand that healthy life imbalance is going to be part of it. Right now, for the most part, you're focused on me or maybe you're focused on something that's going on in your professional life. But we have a family outside of here in some way or we have uh, some own personal needs that maybe we're dealing with as well. So I wanted to kind of tell a story that uh, illustrates that a little bit, um, <laughs> and especially makes sense here in the, the medical setting. My uh, fourth year in the league, fifth year in the league, uh, I was at the New Orleans Saints and I played there for four years. Um, New Orleans at that time was not good. It was my character building years, as I like to say. Uh, but both my kids were born while I was in New Orleans. But to back up a little bit, two times while I was on an NFL practice field, somebody came out to me with a phone and said, you need to take a phone call. Does that sound odd? <laughs> yeah, it is. If you don't know, that does not happen. I've never heard of it happening before, and I've never seen it happen since. Yet it happened twice to me. And in both instances, the first one was my wife putting a, a surgeon on the phone to let me know that Dre, my, my son Blaze, who I just had, who we just had that morning, and I then went to work because again, uh, not balance, imbalance. I had to focus on things. I was there for that, thank goodness. But he he let me know that Blaze needed uh, surgery. He had colon atresia. He could not eat. Um, <coughs> as life moved on, that doesn't seem as that as 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 if it was that serious, but at the time, it was unbelievable. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can kind of imagine with that. In ICU for two weeks, uh, but we get through it and we're good. So now the second call that I have, Drake, this is in the off season, on the phone. Again, wife crying, puts me on the phone with another doctor. This is starting to get old. Um, and. What happened there was I was told that uh, he had gastroschisis. Um, it's kind of nice here. Some people, I saw some heads shake, so you know what that is. I'll just say, you th say this. Uh, it's serious. Um, it takes multiple surgeries at birth. And again, and I see you at, at birth for two weeks. Now, you deal with it as parents. Uh, and we did deal with it. But this was during the season, <coughs> uh, right before the season when Drake was, was had. And I can remember with Drake specifically playing a football game at the Superdome, concentrate on everything that's going on, and then going straight to the bedside of my weak old kid. Where do you think those IVs were coming out of? They're coming out of their head because that's where the, the main parts are. And I'm going to tell you right now, um, everybody's a saint that works in a hospital and does some stuff. But for me and the personal experiences I've had with the NICU and the nurses in there, is unbelievable. And you know what? This is 22 years later, 20 years later, yet I can still cannot tell the story without real, raw, authentic emotion. And that's okay, because it's okay to feel a certain way. Um, but when I think back, had I had perfect life balance, that meant I'm going on a football field to do my job with these other things on my mind. You know, my son that's three years old who had issues, and then my one-year-old, or my, my one-week-old, who I'm gonna, going to go see after the game. And I'll tell you right now, getting ready to snap a ball like this, when somebody's getting ready to rip my throat out, out afterwards and was telling me as such, um, <laughs> if I'm concentrating on my kids and what's going on at the moment in my family life, or even to a degree, I guess, my personal life, I was taking a chance to sacrifice my professional life. And I don't think it's bad that we compartmentalize at times and understand that we have to for certain reasons because otherwise we can't perform. It doesn't mean that you discount one. You know, when people can't juggle, it's because they only focus on one object and the other two fall to the ground. No pun, you know, drop the ball, no pun intended. So that's something I wanted to talk about that I think is very important is as you go through your life, the three areas of your life that we're going to talk about it here in, in a little bit, 
you understand that you know maybe life balance isn't always possible. In, in, in a utopia, in a perfect world, it might be. But the fact is, it, it, this world's not perfect. And sometimes we have to focus on what's at hand for the good and the betterment of everything else in our life. So, when I was juggling those rings so adeptly, I want you to think about those rings as the three parts of your life. Your family, your personal, and your professional. Now, when I was juggling at first, I was juggling straight on. If I was looking at you, what's your name, sir? Scott. Scott, Scott if I'm looking at you, do you do, what do you see? Just a straight line? That's what I see also. Uh, what do you see? Uh, circle. A, a circle. What color is it? Green. Okay, and what, a what do you circle. A white circle, absolutely. I see the same thing you, you see, Scott. You and I are right. They're wrong, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> who's right and who's wrong? Yes. We're all right and we're all wrong. So what am I trying to get at with this? How many different ways are there to look at something? Multiple. You know, and I, I think it's so very important to understand that the view we have sometimes isn't the only view that you can take of a situation. You know, for me, uh, you know, if, if I move around this way, all of a sudden you might say, okay, I see now, it, it's a white circle, you'd agree with her. And if I move this way, you're like, okay, no, it's, it's, it's a green and w w with her. Whereas the whole time, if I hold, uh, steadfast and true to what I see because I know I'm right I see this line I know it you're wrong I'm right that's not always the case and I always encourage no matter what my kids anybody I'm around anytime you have a chance to get out of your shoes and see th things from a different angle a different perspective you have a chance to do a lot better job now again that's what I had on here you saw the lines then you, you saw the object, then you saw the shape, then ultimately you saw the color. And what I'm trying to get at is, you know, juggling, snapping, persistence. But persistence is not merely physical repetition. It's the constant ability to look through someone or something from multiple angles that allows you better understanding. And that one word, understanding, is so very important. But what I just said to you, that persistence, I call that emotional persistence, looking through someone or something from multiple angles that creates that understanding. And understanding does two things. It takes away fears and it fosters relationships. Anything in life, if you can take away fear and you can foster relationship, you've got a chance. So think about that in your personal life, are you trying to figure things out? Or in your family life, with your, your spouse, with your kids, your siblings, your parents. Creating understanding. Here in your professional life, with those you lead, if you can create understanding, you've got a chance. And you know, we as leaders, that's what we're charged to do sometimes. Because the folks that we lead sometimes, they're just not up to that, that level. Not that, not that they're below us or anything, but maybe they just haven't thought of it that way. They need somebody to hold their hand a little bit. Help them, nudge them, push them through. That's what leaders do. They help others. They facilitate the success of others. Laces out. So we've talked about laces out. We've talked about emotional persistence. We're going on the football theme a little bit for me, obviously, because I played for 15 years, 244 games. Um, snap ball, get crap knocked out of you was my, my, uh, my mantra, but it, it worked. But you know what? When you, when you look at football, and most sports, or even band or whatever, you have a depth chart. And, and you basically, you're trying to figure out who gives you the best chance for success, right? We, can we agree that's what we're trying to do? But really, it's a puzzle. And I think this is one of my favorite analogies. You know, when we look at ourselves or those we lead, we've got to look at them as puzzle pieces. And we're trying to paint this picture of success in whatever fashion we're being charged to, to lead in. So when we look at the pieces of the puzzle, ourself being one, right? Just because you're a leader, you're still part of the, pu the puzzle. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I see the, the head's nodding. Thank you. We've got to look at the physical side. Remember, I talked about that. We don't discount that. You've got to look at the physical side, no doubt about it. But what do you do also? What else do you have to look at? You've got to look at the emotional side. And again, the physical side, actions, what we see and do. It's outward as opposed to the emotional side of things, which is our thoughts, what we feel and express. 
Who uh, in here <coughs> over the holidays it may end up doing a, a puzzle of some sort? There's some of you that'll set up. I know we <laughs> will set them up, and if you don't, you know, try it. It's fun. But anyhow, when you set up a puzzle, you want to have a little experiment. Try turn all the pieces upside down, and try to put that puzzle together without seeing the images on t on it. You think you'd be very successful? If the kids came along, they'd be like, "Mom and Dad have lost it." <laughs> all right? Yeah. And, and my kids think I've lost it half the time, anyhow. But I've been hitting the head a lot, so I've got an excuse. <laughs> I don't know what yours is. But again, you think about it. When you're looking at the depth chart and you're trying to put a puzzle together, you've got to see the physical side, but you've got to the emo see the emotional side as well. You can't just look at the shape of the puzzle. You've got to look at the pictures and the image on it. You've got to understand what's inside so you can get a better feeling of how you want to put it together, how that puzzle is going to go together, right? I would agree with this. Now, as leaders, what is the one thing that we as leaders generally do well? Lead. Okay. I'm gonna, am I going to have to use the, the old saying, which you cannot define it with the word itself? But no, we do lead. You're right. But the thing, the thing I'm looking for is we communicate. Would you agree most of the time leaders have the ability to communicate? Yes. Have to be a chameleon of sorts at times because if you've got a big group that, you are, that is reporting to you, it's a lot of different uh, pieces of the puzzle to put together. So, if you're the leader, which piece do you think you would be in this puzzle? It's rhetorical. You're the middle, right? Why is that? Yeah, absolutely. You can connect on all four sides, right? Exactly. Yes. Now, that being said, uh, are we any better than any other puzzle pieces? We are not. We are just different. And I think that's important to, to, to make that distinction. Because the fact is, when you start a puzzle, what do you start with? The edges or the corners. Corners that can only connect on two sides. The edges, three. Yet, we see them somewhat as most important. And, and I think that's a good analogy. You're only as strong as your weakest link. And actually, they're not weakest links. They're just links that don't communicate as well. Those people who maybe, commu or maybe work in maybe some seclusion or off by themselves, they want to feel part of the puzzle. They want to feel a part of everything. And it's our job, I believe, as leaders, to make them feel a part of it. Human beings are pack animals. We crave surrounding, uh, we crave being around other people. And I think that's something that's very important to take note of. So think about it in, in, in whatever number of people you lead is, do you take time to make sure they feel included? Do you take time to ask them how they feel? what's going on in not only their work life, but their personal life, their family life. I'm not saying you have to sit down for 10 minutes with them, but if you show sincere appreciation, if you show sincere interest, it makes a difference. Bobby April was a special teams coach of mine for the Pittsburgh Steelers and then for the New Orleans Saints, six years. And I never once saw him uh, refer to a player on the team as, hey, you, or what's up, big guy, or hey, buddy, you know, what we do when we don't know their name. And I was guilty of that in college. He knew everybody's name. It's a little thing, but it's a really important thing. Now, not only did he know their name, oftentimes he knew, he knew where they went to school and he knew their mascot. It may seem like a simple thing, but the guys on the team, they appreciated it. Because let's be honest, um, some of the people uh, that play in the NFL that I played with, I mean, there's a violence to it, otherwise they wouldn't be there. Now, as I always say, violent people didn't grow up in Beverly Hills, they grew up in violent places. And sometimes the fact of somebody knowing their name and showing some interest in them, that can make all the difference in the world to them. So I would say to you, as you look at your depth chart, as you look at the physical side of it, as you look at the emotional side of it, do you take time to stop and get to know folks? that you're leading, and do you make them feel appreciated? Appreciation. It takes nothing to go by and tell somebody thank you for the job they've done. It doesn't cost a thing, yet it's priceless. I'm going to tell you, I really appreciated, <laughs> quite honestly, I played for Coach uh, Vermeil, who we'll talk about in a little bit, Coach Ditka, uh, uh, who else, Coach Cower. I was a long snapper. Other than the punter and the kicker, I was the worst athlete on the field. <laughs> Um, but I appreciated that they knew my name. 
and they took time. And it sounds like a little thing, but as you can see from me, and I think the authenticity I'm showing when I talk about it, it wasn't. It made a difference. I wanted to know that I mattered. We as people, we as human beings, we inherently, in our altruistic nature, we want to make a difference in some way. And as a leader, if you can make sure that they understand that they do make a difference, again, I think that goes a long way. So I want to tell you a quick story. Coach Dick Vermeil, um, he came to the Kansas City Chiefs in 2001, my second year there. I played for him for five years. Now, um, when you get a new leader, generally what do they do with the, the, the folks that are there? We'll say team, team members, whatever you want to call it, players. You kind of have an entrance ex, uh, interview where you, you get to know them a little bit. So I'm going to tell you about mine with Coach Vermeil that first year. This was year nine. And at this point in time, I was widely considered the best long snapper in the league. So basically the best at my particular craft in the world. Granted, throwing a ball between my legs. But all the same, um, it paid well. But as I walked in there, I was excited about it to hear what he said because Coach Vermeil, he played in two Super Bowls, or he had coached two Super Bowls. He had won one of those. And I walked in, and as I get to and I walk in, before I can sit down, uh, Wes, he says, he goes, I just want you to know that I don't want you on the team. Wow. You talk about taking some wind out of my cell. I was like, okay. I was speechless. But I sat down, took a deep breath, and I said, okay, coach. Uh, I hear you. Um, why do you not want me on the team? He said, well, Kendall, you do a very good job. You're great at what you do. But I want somebody who can uh, back up a position and save a roster spot as well. Now, I'd been hearing that my whole career. And uh, so I wasn't completely surprised once he told me that. So at least I knew. And I remember taking a deep breath and then looking at him and saying, well, coach, I appreciate you telling me this. And just so you know, those people don't exist, and I am going to be on this team. Now, I don't remember the rest of the uh, meeting, but I know this, it was not very long. <laughs> and uh, uh, I remember getting out, up and walking out of there wondering, okay, what the hell have I just done? But what I did was I communicated my emotions and what I felt and what I believed. And even though we were new uh, to each other, the fact is I believed if he could tell me what he thought, why couldn't I tell him what I thought? So fast forward to the end of the season, of which I played and made the team. And I walk in, and once again, as I walk in, before I can sit down, he said, Kendall, I apologize. I couldn't have been more wrong. I was like, there we go. That's what I'm looking for, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I said, let's hear this one. This is what I was looking for at the beginning of the season. He said, you know what? I remember I told you that I didn't want you here. I didn't realize. I didn't realize somebody that does what you do physically in that position, I didn't realize they could lead emotionally like you do. I didn't realize that they could bring more to the team because I've never experienced that before. So I just want to tell you I'm sorry, and I like having you on the team. <laughs> now, think about in my situation, uh, ha had I reacted wrong to that first initial meeting and cussed him out, uh, because there's players who would, uh, or got mad or decided, well, there's no, re no use in trying. He told me I'm not gonna be on the team. So take that to your, your life and what's going on in any facet of your life, be it here in the professional side or even uh, at home or personally in terms of the open, honest communication that you can have. Because if you don't, as an organization, you will never get to where you want to go. Again, it's like turning the puzzle pieces over and trying to do it without understanding a person and what they're about. All you can see is the shape. You can't see the color. You can't get a feel for who they are. I think that's so very important. And Coach Vermeil and I, actually, he was just in town this last week. He invited me to a wine, a wine tasting dinner at Plaza 3. It was fabulous, and um, it was complimentary, which I liked. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Long snappers and head coaches don't form a true bond all the time. Yet, he thought enough to call me personally and invite me, and that meant a lot. And I truly believe it has a lot to do with our time together, those five years with the Kansas City Chiefs. So I would implore you encourage you when you have a chance to put that puzzle together that you're leading and you're trying to paint that picture make sure you see not only the shape of the people that you're leading and you're putting together but you see their color you see the emotions that you show the interest you know I'll sum it up with this physical traits are what we notice most often but the emotional ones are often overlooked but when you, foster, when you recognize and foster the emotional strength within someone, including yourself, 
you, you allow the possibility of stepping up and accomplishing more than you ever could have imagined by yourself. You allow the team the ability to step up and accomplish more than they ever could have imagined on their own. That's what leaders do. They inspire and they take that group along with them and make them realize that they're capable of more than they ever thought possible. Physical traits get to a certain point. We can only do stuff at a certain level physically. But emotionally, we can continue to grow and we can continue to care and we can continue to make a, a difference in the life of those that we work with. And then again, take it home to your spouse, to your significant other, to your, to your kids, your, your parents, whoever it may be. Live that not only here, but out in the world because if you do, it makes a difference. It's noticed. So let's move on. <coughs> Kansas City Chiefs, we talked about that play. Who is that in the middle? Andy Reid, absolutely. Andy Reid, it's interesting. It looks like uh, he, he should have been uh, born in the middle of Nebraska, yet he grew up in inner city L.A. And he, was, uh, he went to a school where he was the minority, actually. And <clears throat> he is one of the best people I've ever been around in my life. He is a good person. So here recently, we played the New England Patriots. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Did we, we had some issues, right? Do you remember that? What was our issue? Where's those damn bags, right? Yeah, we got there. I was there in the morning. We could not get into the facility the night before, so we had to come in the morning. And the radio crew, we went out there, and we were going to help because they, they had a tall task, the equipment staff. And we got there, and we're unloading everything. There's literally three big uh, trucks full of stuff. And, you know, having played for 15 years and have been around everything, I recognized some stuff, and I was just, just like, I don't see all the bags, but surely they're here somewhere. And um, at the end... Uh, we figured out, uh, our equipment manager figured out that they were somewhere. He just did not know where. <laughs> and um, it was interesting to watch him deal with things because instantly, I watched, I'm, I'm sitting there watching, we're, we're carrying the other stuff. I watched him just get on his phone and he's just talking. And I can see a look of concern on his face, but he's just quietly, calmly, and coolly going about his business. And that happens for about 45 minutes while we're still putting things up. And he still doesn't know where they're, they're, they're at. And it, it's kind of funny, and, and just, you know, I'll cut to the chase quickly on one part. It was not Belichick, but it made for, <laughs> but, but in my mind, those jokes that we got about Belichick, that's what the internet is for, <laughs> is to do things like that. But I digress. So uh, Dan Israel, the executive producer for the Kansas City, or for the Chiefs Radio Network, good friend of mine, um, obviously, because I'm on that network with him. And we went back to, to Alan, and we're like, dude, um, I'm impressed. I mean, I know you don't know where stuff is are, and we're trying to figure it out. Um, but I, I, this is what I said to him. I said, I know this. If that were the case with Dan Israel, we would have had some expletives out of his mouth a long time ago. And Dan agreed that he would have. And, uh, and Alan's like, he goes, you know, I, I just, I, I, I know they're somewhere. We know we got them on the plane. We talked a little bit. And I just said, well, you know, I'm impressed with, with how you're handling yourself. And at that time, he gets a text, and he goes, <laughs> He just kind of laughs, and he shows it to me, he, he, and, and he shows, it's from uh, Coach Reed. He had, first and foremost, when he found out what was going on, which is he did not know where 35 of the bags were. We only traveled 15 people, or 50 people, so we only had 50 bags, or we only had 15 bags, which was not enough. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't want that to get out to Coach, uh, to, uh, Coach Reed in any other way, sh shape, or form, so he made sure and he got a hold of him through text and let him know what was going on. And the text he got back from Coach Reed is fabulous. He said, was just out taking a walk, went by a garage sale, saw some helmets. Do you want me to pick them up? <laughs> Who in here would have reacted that way as a leader? I, kn I know I wouldn't have. And I wouldn't blame you if you didn't, but that's how he did. Now, he had one more line, which was nothing like a little game day anxiety to get the blood pumping. It's just pretty damn cool. This dude is on his game. Now, that ability to have that open and honest communication going up and going down, that didn't start that day, didn't start that week, didn't start that year. It started five years ago when Coach... Coach Reed came to Kansas City and that relationship with Alan Wright. Alan Wright is the one on the left. And actually, the, the, the boy on the right is Alan's son. And, you know, they're close. And they've been close for a long time. 
Coach Reed recognizes everything that Allen does. Allen has been uh, a part of the Chiefs, I think it's 33 years now, longest tenured employee there. He came as a page, he was driving people to the airport to where now he's the head equipment manager, one of the most respected in the business. But again, that open and honest communication, going up and going down, and I would say going sideways as well. So take that into your life. Certainly here at Freeman, but even at home with your family or yourself, because you've got to communicate with yourself also. Are you open and honest with things? Can you tell each other everything without fear of repercussions? Do you lead through fear or do you lead through understanding and trying to help people be better? I understand to a degree there has to be a little bit of a healthy mix to it uh, to have some edge. But I would say this, um, going after them and, and, and perhaps treating things the way Coach Reed that day, I would say could go a long way, could serve as a, a good example for all of us. I was fortunate enough to play with a, a guy by the name of Morton Anderson. Has anybody heard of Morton Anderson? Absolutely. He played in the NFL for 25 years. 25 years. That's ridiculous. Um, he's in the Hall of Fame. I was there with him. I was a friend. It's as close, as, the, the, as, as close to the Hall of Fame as I'm ever going to get. Uh, but it was a good time. But the one thing that stuck with me in the years that I played with him was he had this saying, this saying which was, Powerful, productive relationships are based on powerful, productive communication. Maybe it's been said before, but I've never heard it said by anybody but him. Now, he not only believed that and, and dealt with it, and I think that's what helped get him in those 25 years. He had the physical side of it, no doubt, but he had the emotional side, and I like that in the communication. But he liked that quote so, so much that he keeps it to this day in his pocket at all times or in his coat. He does not go anywhere without that quote because he heard it uh, from a coach early on in his career and he decided, you know what, that makes sense. And you know what, I, I just think that's a pretty cool thing. When we're talking about, you know, uh, the, the, the bag gate, as we want to call it, and everything that was going on, ultimately, ultimately, Alan figured out where the, the bags were. They were, in New they were in Newark. We didn't ship them there. The people that unloaded the, uh, the airplane, they forgot to look in an area. Uh, and they said the plane was empty. And actually the chief's personnel, they're not allowed to actually get in the plane. So they had to take them at their word. Uh, they made a mistake, it happens. And when they found out that it was in Newark, they flew them right down there and they got a police escort and they were there two hours before the game. That being said, Allen had already uh, reached out to high schools with red helmets who had up-to-date red helmets and he had them ready to go. Not to play the game because they knew they were gonna have the equipment for the game, but so they could warm up and at least not have any of their routine um, messed up. And I think that as a leader uh, speaks volumes about the fact of, okay, um, things are going hay haywire, but am I going to remain calm? And I'm, am I going to figure out what I have to do to make things work? And more importantly, do I have a relationship with those that I answer to or those that are answering to me that we can talk like human beings and adults and figure this out and not get too emotional? Because when we get too emotional, then all of a sudden, I think that's when your, your problems start to creep in. So, Let's move along. We talked about football a little bit. I want to now take you back to high school a little bit for me. Uh, I'm the one on the far left or far right, rocking the sweet mustache. <laughs> the other one is a guy by the name of Scott Dennis. Um, Scott Dennis was my best friend from the age 10 up. You know, think about this person in your life. You, everybody has a person in your life, I think, that no matter how long it's been, the minute you get back with them, it's like time stood still and um, you, you're right back where, where it is. You, can people, can you think about somebody like that? That was Scott for me. We did everything together. Seven years ago, I'm having lunch with someone and I get a call. And they let me know that Scott had went down to the Walmart about four miles from where I was at at that point in time and he had taken his life. Now, uh, that was, as you might imagine, especially difficult. And um, I instantly began to question a whole bunch of things that was going on with me. Because not to make it worse, but to add something to that situation, Scott had been at my house the night before to pay me back some money that he owed for some tickets. Now, I don't, I don't think that uh, this was planned. I think he caught a weak moment. But all the same, you can imagine, think about that person um, that you saw hours ago. 
It never imagined to me that I wouldn't see him alive again. And it was something hard to handle. I tell this story because it needs to be told. As hard as it is. I don't blame myself, but I wonder. Emotional persistence. Had I looked through things differently, I wasn't able to talk to him that night. Uh, my wife at the time was. I was on a very important business call, and we'd just been at practice or something also. I see him all the time. I mean, I said hi, obviously, and he was fine. He was la laughing. He was jovial. I never thought that I would never see him alive again. And it just, it just makes me wonder, though. Had I used emotional persistence, had I looked at him <coughs> from all different angles, could I have done something? I don't blame myself, but I wonder. You know, I did know that he was going through a divorce, and having been through a divorce myself, I know that's tough. Um, I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. His personal life, or that was his, or his um, family life, so I know that was an issue. His work life, his professional life, that was okay. He was doing great there, he had things planned. But what I did not know, what I had failed to see, was he was losing a battle with alcohol. And he had done a really nice job of hiding it, unfortunately. I found out later that his mother was aware, and that was about it. And they were working on it. But unfortunately, he caught, he caught a weak moment. And I talk about it because it needs to be talked. I mean, in a group this size, almost everybody <coughs> has been touched by suicide in their lives in, in some way. It's not Kevin Bacon's six degrees of separation. I believe it's one degree of separation. And I will say this, if, you happen to be, if somebody happens to be in here that you don't have any uh, experience with this, as of knowing somebody and, and dealing with it, I hope you realize how truly fortunate you are and how truly unique you are, because this is rampant. When I look at it, and, and, and when I say that, it's, it's you don't have that personal situation. I, I understand that. But I'm going to tell you about my personal situation, which is this. That's a house that I grew up in three miles south of Rose Hill on a farm. And it was tough. <clears throat> it began, we, I moved there when I was age 10, and I lived there until I was age 18. From the ages 10 until roughly 16 or 17, uh, I was abused on a daily basis, emotionally and occasionally physically. I remember one specific time being backed into the corner by my mom, hitting the head multiple times. And we can all agree that's not supposed to happen. Clearly, she had issues as well. And I've come to grips with that. I'm okay with that. So we're good there. But at the time, a 16-year-old, I didn't know what to think. And what I was <laughs> thinking was not good. And what I did was go down to the basement of my room and then next to it, my brother's room, and take the shotgun out and walk over to my room and wonder, would this make it better? Would this be the solution? But it never is taking your life. When people decide that the pain of living is worse than the pain of dying, that's when we're, they're haywire and things aren't going correctly. They decide that they're going to have a permanent solution to a temporary problem. You know, I think about it. Had I made the same, uh, the, the same decision that my, my uh, friend Scott made, what would I have missed? So many great things. My kids, my career. I wouldn't be here speaking to you and trying to make a difference. And the fact is, everybody has a weak moment. Everybody deals with things. We as leaders, we're called to help those that we're, we deal with. That's why I talk about it, because we're affected in some way. The fact is, my guess would be a few people in here have had those thoughts. I've never done a talk where somebody doesn't contact me afterwards and talk about it. And I talk about them with it as well. And I believe the fact of me talking about it openly and honestly then hopefully gives others the permission to think about it and decide maybe they need to do something. You know, for me, uh, between that and between my divorce, last three years, I've been in, in counseling uh, about a, an every other week uh, visit, or every other, yeah, two, two, two weeks or two uh, times a, a month. And uh, I've got no problem telling people that because we all need help at times. We all need to be listened to. We need somebody to help guide us. And sometimes, you all may have to be those leaders for the people you deal with and encourage them. Or other times, you have to go other ways. I, I would probably put up the number of, of visits that I've had against you all collectively. Uh, and I've got no problem with that. Again, I feel like if I talk about things openly and honestly and vulnerably, 
then hopefully that gives you the ability to think, okay, well then I can as well, or I can go help somebody else and I can do what he's doing. That's what I'm talking about. A lot of stats there uh, to, to, to think about. I don't know how many you can see, but this is the one that I think is really egregious. I'm going to talk with you about an hour today. In that hour, five people in the United States are going to take their life. Maybe that doesn't sound like a lot unless you know that person, and then it's one too many. And unfortunately, I've dealt with that one too many times. So that's, again, why I chat about it. So let's move on a little bit. You know, I've taken you into my personal life, and I go down a little bit, but I want to have a little fun also, too. I, I want to take you into my professional life, you know, playing with the Steelers, playing with the Saints. I tried to forget those years a little bit, but um, <laughs> they were okay. And then playing with the Chiefs my last seven years. So I made up a little uh, video. Um, it's a little bit humorous. I've circled myself because I know we're not all trained to find where the long snapper's at. So um, have a look. went down like he was shot. Well, Buchanan makes a move on him. We got two Kansas City guys down. But Buchanan makes a move on Campbell Gannon, number 83. And when he makes this move, Gannon, watch over on the left-hand side. See the guy at the top? Watch him. He's going to make a move, and he just goes down. He tore his knee. That is Kendall Gammon, the long snapper for Kansas City, and he was hurt on this play. You'll see it on the uh, replay right after the snap. They just actually run over him here. He gets knocked down. And watch when he gets up again. His own man hits him and he goes back down. And then Gammon, we saw him go down twice. He fell down a third time as he was trying to hustle downfield to cover that kick. So two I was not shot, uh, but what had actually happened was on that play, when I came off of the line of scrimmage, somebody hit me directly in the knee right here with their knee and they broke my leg. Uh, at the time I didn't know it, I'm not that bright, let's be honest. Um, I just knew that it hurt really, really bad. But I remember the guy returning the kick was Philip Buchanan and he was coming to my right. And I was like, well, well great, because I see him, he's getting out, I see that I'm, maybe I'm gonna have to affect this a little bit. And, and so I start going that angle and I'm limping and right as he makes the cut, and I, I got to a point where I had to make him go inside and somebody made the tackle, so I made a difference. Um, but I went down, as I said, like I was shot. But, but what I'm trying to get at with that is, you know, for me, as a long snapper, my job was to snap the ball and get the crap knocked out of me, and I did a really good job of it. And then at the very end, I was supposed to run down and try to make a tackle. Now, I always looked at myself as more of a sheepdog. Um, I like to herd them to the other people. I thought tackles were showy. <laughs> you buying that? No, you're not, okay. I didn't get a lot of tackles, but I did take a lot of nice angles and I did push them to other people. And really, I continued to snap that half and it, was, it wasn't until at halftime they took me in and they got an x-ray and realized that my leg was broke and, uh, I uh, said, you, you can't play anymore. And I said, well, what if, what if I decide to go in of my own volition? They said, we will take your helmet and hide it if that's what you're going to do. And I said, no, I won't. Um, fully knowing that if it came down to one last snap for a field goal, I knew I could get on the field for one time before they took my helmet away. Luckily, it never happened. And um, 
those last six games of the, of the year were the only games I, I ever missed. I was not allowed. I, I wanted to play through the pain, however it was on. Uh, it was where some nerves or, so, I don't know, some medical thing that they said could be bad, and I trusted them. Mm -hmm. And so they, they put me on IR. But my message in this is this. <clears throat> when you're in the game, when things are going on, and that team, those guys, you, those people that you lead or that you work with, can they count on you no matter what? You know, what's your broken leg and will you get up from it? For me, I mean, I, I remember Will Shields, a few of those guys are like, Kendall, just, just stay down. It hurts us seeing you, you, you go like that. But they also had a healthy respect for the thing, for the fact of I was never going to give up. And I think as team members, you know, the physical side that we do each and every time, that's great when things are great. But what happens in adversity when things aren't going perfectly? Are you going to get up? Are you going to herd, herd it to somebody else and let them make the tackle and help them be successful? Again, laces out, facilitating the success of others. That's my charge to you, which is you know, not only facilitating that success, but then when things go wrong, what will you do to make sure that they know that you have their back and that you're going to help them out no matter what, no matter the pain, no matter the issues? I think that's so very important. So I want to take you into my, my life my seven years with the, with the Kansas City Chiefs, Arrowhead Stadium, loudest stadium in the, in the world. My game day, uh, an hour and 15 minutes before the game, I, I came out onto the uh, field, uh, punts, field goals, we did all that stuff, returners, and I came off to the side. And I would find a ball, uh, like this one out of the bag, and I would go find a kid in the crowd, and I'd walk up to them uh, and their family, and I'd just say, have you ever gotten a ball before, much like I did Amber, where's Amber? Amber. And of course, you would shake your head no. Um, and um, I said, well, you know what? I, I hope you have a great time today. I hope you enjoy it. I did that each and every time that I played as a Kansas City Chief. Now, as you can imagine, I got a lot of different letters from the kids, from the parents. I signed the balls. I signed pictures, stories of they slept with the ball, day, month, weeks, a year. What's that? You'll sleep with your ball. <laughs> very, very nice. Um, you know, it's kind of fun. It's kind of, well, I'll tell you the story. Uh, I'm in Oakland, that cesspool that will no longer house games anymore after this week. Is that too strong? That's not. I don't think so. I remember uh, I'm in Oakland, and I'm walking up to the black hole uh, in, my, my, uh, in my jersey and everything after I've warmed up. And Raider fan is not too happy. He, he does not like the fact that Kendall is approaching the bench. Meanwhile, there's probably a 9, 10-year-old kid next to him with their mom and dad. Raider fans cussing like a sailor, has no idea that they're there. <clears throat> but I walk up and I say to that kid, have you ever gotten a ball before? And he says no. Or invariably he says, <laughs> which I took to mean no. And I said, well, you know what? I hope you have a good time with your family today. I hope you remember this. And uh, here you go. And I gave him a game ball. Now, again, he had a Raiders jersey on. It didn't matter what jersey they had on. It was just about making a memory. And sometimes it's about affecting others as well while you make that memory. Because Raider fan, Raider fan who saw all this was right next to me. He just looked at me as like, number 83, just leave. <laughs> just go. And, and I just kind of smiled. He goes, I can't boo you now. Just get out of here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I always tell that story because I think it's funny. And, you know, it, as I said, I, I get all these different uh, letters and whatever. I remember I got one one time um, from the parents, and it said, when you gave him the ball, he wanted to leave. He was afraid somebody was going to steal it. I can only assume that was Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to share... I want to share this letter with you. I got this one from Dustin Beath, Pawnee City, City, Nebraska. You can't read all of it, but he was very happy that he got it. He thanked me. He was 10 years old. Three years ago, I wake up in the morning. I have an instant message on Twitter because I tweet all the time. Um, I don't have instant messages very often, but I have this one. I look at it because I'm curious. It's from Dustin Beath. He says, hey, do you remember me? You gave me a ball when I was 10 years old. I was like, Actually, Dustin, I do remember you. I use your letter in my talks. And we talked, we went back and forth a little bit, and then I said, you know what? You must be in college by now. He said, yeah, I'm 23. Uh, I'm going to be a welder. I'm in a technical school. And um, then at the end, after a few more uh, pleasantries, I just said, I said, I have one more question. Do you still have that ball? And what he said still affects me to this day. 
which is this. He said, I will never not have that ball. You know, when I gave those balls out to those kids each and every year, no press followed me. Nobody knew about it. I wanted to make a difference in somebody's life for no other reason than I thought it was the right thing to do. And that's one of my charges to you today. The people you lead, your spouse, significant other, your, your kids, whoever it may be in that family. <coughs> make a difference because it's the right thing to do. And, that you, and be thankful also that you have the ability to make the difference in somebody's life. Something as small and insignificant as a piece of aired up leather that I gave to that boy, <clears throat> he will never let go. You know, in the NFL, we give game balls <clears throat> uh, to, to show gratitude, tell somebody thank you for what they've done, or we get a ball of somebody telling us thank you and showing that gratitude. And certainly this time of season, we always, we, we always hear about it, you know, about showing grat gratitude, being thankful for what you have and where you're at. It's, it's just not a seasonal thing. It's a lifetime thing, uh, in, in my opinion. Gratitude to me, I think, is one of the basic and most raw, or the, the rawest of all emotions. But I think it's, the most, it's one of the most important. So, i show you this slide quickly. May 22nd, 2011. That date rings true around here quite a bit. The Joplin tornado. <clears throat> that is the room of Will Norton. His parents asked me to walk up to that room after I had a visit with them a couple weeks after his uh, celebration of life. I didn't know what to expect. When I opened the door, that's what I saw. I immediately, immediately began to weep uncontrollably. If you can't tell, elegant graffiti fashion on the left side is the, is the name Will. On the right side, the number 83. That was my number, 83. To the right of that, in a case, is a ball. A ball I gave him when his family came up to visit us about two or three years prior to that. And then my picture as well. Will, apparently, I had had an effect on him because we lived next to each other in Carl Junction for several years. Our kids did things together. Uh, Will and Sarah, you know, uh, that whole family. That you, somebody here probably knows them. They're great people, obviously. And it just it began to dawn on me how thankful for I was that somebody thought enough of me and what I had done for them for no other reason than I just wanted to do something that they would thank me by putting my number on their wall. And again, that's a charge to you. What can you do to make a difference in the others for no other, no other reason than it's the right thing to do? What can you do? What can you do to make somebody want to put your number on their wall? And I'm going to tell you right now, I believe that's what life's about is making a difference in the life of another. That's what you do here as a health system. It's a huge thing. It's never been more real than right here. And you as a team, I, I know, I've, I've read statistics and, and how you all operate. You guys are top notch and you should be commended for that. It's a pretty cool thing. And I want you to know that. So, I'm talking about gratitude. A recognition that we could not be who we are or where we are without the contribution of others. Nobody does any, anything on their own, even if they think they do. They don't. Somehow somebody's contributed in some way. Maybe it was a long time ago. Maybe it's, some, it's something they don't have. But our understanding that we cannot be where we are or who we are without the help of others, I think, makes a big difference. Now, so let's sum this up a little bit. We came back to this laces out. Facilitating the success of others. As team members, as leaders, what are you going to take back? What are you going to do for that, those team members you lead? What are you going to do for your family? And I would say this, what are you going to do for yourself? Because I think that's important also. Even those people you lead and they don't have a direct report, they have one direct, direct report actually, and that's to themselves, self-care. We're gonna talk about that more. Laces out. Think thank you, the power of gratitude. <clears throat> it's right in front of you if you look. I don't have to chase extraordinary moments to find happiness. It's right in front of me if I'm paying attention and I'm practicing gratitude. I'm going to tell you what, I love Brene Brown and what she talks about and the vulnerability. It's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing if you can handle it emotionally. <clears throat> and the next one is a bowling ball, right? That makes sense. No? <laughs> Anybody got any guesses? Well... Here's your Kodak moment. 
I saw this on YouTube last night. <laughs> balls, clubs, rings, bowling balls. So what I'm going to attempt to do is I'm going to throw this first ball up, and I'm going to throw the second ball up, and then I'm going to throw the third ball up, and I'm going to run like hell. <laughs> no, actually, um, I am going to attempt to do this. Uh, again, looked easy last night on YouTube. I thought, what the heck? Uh, I will say this. Sometimes the balls do actually hit, and if they do, uh, they'll shoot out in whatever direction. So, you know, have some fun with it. Put a, put a look of terror on your face. You all up here, it'll come naturally. You don't have to worry about it at all. So here we go. Three bowling balls. Thank you. I played in the NFL for 15 years. I considered myself a world-class athlete at a point. I just juggled bowling balls for roughly five seconds and I'm winded. <laughs> but I didn't juggle them just for the Kodak moment, although that was nice. I juggled them again to make a point, which is this. No one is a bowling ball. What do I mean by that? You know, when I talked about the ring, straight on or from either side, first of all, you saw a line, an object, and then you saw a shape, and then you saw a collar. Three distinct parts of our life. Personal, professional, family. If I hold up a bowling ball, no matter what I do, what is it? It's one perfectly round, spherical object. It's a hard word for me to say. And I think too often in life, sometimes we get caught up in trying to be a bowling ball, trying to be perfect at all times to everyone. And I know this personally because this is what I did until I was about 46 or 47. Ultimately, a lot of it had to do with the failing of my marriage, trying to be perfect to everybody and everything. And I wanted, I wanted some of that adulation for people to see me as the savior, that I was taking care of stuff. But the one person I failed to take care of was myself and I let myself die inside. And I wish that hadn't happened, but uh, I can't do anything about that now. I can only do what I do now, which is heal from it and get better and hopefully take that me message to others. No one is a bowling ball. Again, taking care of yourself. So let's take that a step further. <clears throat> I fly all the time. <clears throat> what is this? We know what? Oxygen mask, right. Who are you supposed to put this on first? Yourself. Yourself. And then who? Others, right? For 47 years, the best I could do, I tried to put it on everybody else. And eventually, I ran out of oxygen. Eventually, I ran out of oxygen. So my question to you is, what is your emotional oxygen? What are you going to do to take care of yourself first? It is not selfish to take care of yourself first and then others. Because if you don't, eventually you run out of the oxygen and you do what I did. And your life becomes a mess for a little while, even though everybody thought it was perfect. I mean, from the outside, I was married to a beautiful lady, two kids, dogs, beautiful house, played in the NFL for 15 years, a Pro Bowl, a Super Bowl. It was perfect. Yet I had issues that were unfulfilled. And you know what? It's, it's tough to talk about, quite honestly. But it's on me. And, in, and certainly, in marriages, it always takes two. But if we're going to put the bulk of it, the bulk of it's going to go on me. And it, it is what it is. But again, what is your emotional oxygen? Who can you talk about? What can you do to make sure that you're OK internally, so that you're ready to put that mask on everybody else? Not only here at Freeman, but at home. I think that makes a huge difference. And you know, the fact is, with the bowling balls and everything, we're really what we're getting at also, because I didn't, I didn't do this for the longest time, which was we don't, give our, we don't give ourselves the chance to be, not to, the chance to not be perfect. And, and I want to give you a, a chance to fail at something and be okay with it. So you can now open your, uh, your packages. And what you're going to see in there <coughs> Is a, is a pad, you don't have to take that out right now, but the other thing you're going to see is three, you've got three scarves in there. They should look like this. So, 
I want you to take all those scarves and put them on the table in front of you. Just however you want to do it. Now I want you to stand up with me. Not stand up with me. You stand up by yourself. It would be weird if we all stood up together. Um, and we are going to learn to juggle. So, our first thing here, we're going to do this. This may take five minutes, maybe, maybe less. But first thing is we're going to take one, one scarf, put it in our dominant hand. If you're right-handed, that's your right hand. If you're left-handed, that's your left hand. You wouldn't think I have to explain it, but I did once. And what we're going to do is we're going to, you, uh, you don't do it first. I'll do it first, then you can do it with me. You're going to take it up there, and then you're going to catch it with the other hand. Now, will you, why do we use scarves? Yes, because it would be a disaster if we all use bowling balls, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, the first thing, again, you have permission to fail. You don't have to be perfect. But right now, we're going to do this. One scarf. Up, here we go. Up, up, and catch it with the other hand. Did anybody miss it? <laughs> oh, my God. That is beautiful. Yeah. The, the guy back there, he's like, he went like this. It wasn't him, but somebody else did. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I confess, I confess, he did it. So right here. So again, up, the other side. We catch it with the hand. Now up and catch it with the other hand. <clears throat> so we're going right, left, right, left. <clears throat> that's okay. I, I didn't see that. I, absolutely. So, okay, so we've done that. Now, that's all juggling is, except you've got to do three of them. So the first thing, though, the next thing we're going to do is two, right? So now we've got one in each hand. We've kind of grabbed it in the middle, and we're going to go one, two, catch. One, two, catch. Absolutely. One, two, catch. Paula, I'm going to tell you right now, these people are gifted. This is impressive. Absolutely. Yes. OK. OK, you can hold them for just a second. Now. Oh. Now, oh man, I may not be perfect here. Uh-oh, what's going to happen? Now, <clears throat> now you're going to, have, you're going to ha hold one kind of with uh, the two fingers, and then your, your, uh, your first finger and your thumb, you're going to hold the other ones. That way you can hold two together, because you're going to have to throw that one up and throw the next one. So you've got two in one hand, one in the other. And I'll demonstrate first. It's going to go one, two, three catch. Or you can keep going. It gets windy in here sometimes. You didn't see that, right? Okay, so go ahead. <clears throat> oh, yeah, absolutely. That's nice. <clears throat> well, we're going to go about 10, 15 more seconds. Hey, I'm a long snapper. What do you expect? I wasn't going to come in here and just talk at you. All right, good enough. Okay, we can all sit down. First and foremost, give yourselves a hand for embracing that. Who learned to juggle? Okay, who didn't learn to juggle? Okay, and um, some others. Well, I don't know what you did if you didn't, if you didn't learn... Uh, and you did learn, I'm, I'm, you, you didn't either, but it's this. So, I want to talk about this. We talk about self-care. Self I, I forgot about this uh, on the mantra. You know, when we talk about our self-care, it's making sure that, our, that we are important, that we understand that we've got to take care of ourselves. And the fact is, our mind, listens to whatever we, our mind listens to whatever we tell it. And I used to tell myself a lot of bad things internally. I would never talk to people the way I talked to myself for years. And that helped, honestly, that probably helped drive me uh, to where I got in the NFL. I understand that. Uh, but it was, it was out of fear. And it was out of, um, I don't know, just basically that fear. But what I began to realize is I've got to take care of myself and understand that, that I don't have to be perfect all the time. That's why we juggled. That's one of the reasons we, we juggled is I wanted you to, to take a chance and be okay with failing at something and understanding that it's not the end of the world. And for me, <clears throat> a, a mantra that I talk about, or a mantra that I say to myself a lot, which is this, I matter, I make a difference, I am enough. I matter, I make a difference, I am enough. But then you can take that to the, the folks that you lead. And you make sure that they know that they matter and that they make a difference and that they are enough. 
then maybe you take that home to your spouse and you let her know or him know that they matter, that they make a difference, that they, they are enough. And I will tell you right now, if there's anything you could instill in kids that would do the greatest good, I truly believe it's those three things. You let a, you, you let a, a kid know that they matter, that they make a difference, and that they are enough. That's special. And today's world, that's tough with social media and what's going on sometimes. It can kind of be tough. It really can. But again, understanding that we don't have to be perfect and understanding that whatever we give is enough. It doesn't mean that it's perfect and that we can, we can always try to get better, but we've got to understand that as long as we try to do the best we can, we've got a chance. So, <clears throat> focus equals feelings. So, when, we just, when I said I was going to juggle, uh, who in here was excited about that, that prospect? A few were, okay. Who were, who were kind of like, oh, what, what is this? You didn't know what to think, right? Was there some people there with that also? Probably so. And there's some other people who were like, this is stupid. Uh, you know, hopefully it wasn't too many. Um, but it happens. I mean, <clears throat> everybody's allowed to feel the way they feel. And ultimately what that comes down to is our focus and what we decide to focus on and then the meaning we, we decide to give it. That then produces our feelings. The experience you just had learning to juggle very, was very much determined before you started juggling and went through the, 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 through the experience. Why? Because you decided to focus on something and you gave it meaning, even before you got there and gave it a chance. And some of you did just fine. And you know what, how it is, I'm just trying to make this point, which how you felt was the meaning that you assigned to it. So focus equals feelings, and what I'm trying to get to is ultimately it equals this, your quality of life. Because our quality of life is to depend upon how we feel moment to moment. And how we feel has to do with our feelings, our emotions. And those are created by what meaning we give to what we're focusing on. So what does this mean? Basically, we have to be intentional about what we focus on, and we have to be intentional about the feelings. But again, nobody's perfect. Just because I espouse this stuff and talk about it doesn't mean that I don't make mistakes, and that sometimes I let my emotions get the better of me. But then I kind of back it up a, a little bit, and I realize that maybe, okay, it's not the end of the world, that we'll figure some things out. Maybe I'm Andy Reid, and I realize, you know what? I know the guy that's trying to deal with this is completely stressed, and I'm gonna have a little fun with it make sure he knows it's okay that we're gonna figure this out. You think about that in your own life. You take that to the people you lead. You take that to your family. You take that to your friends, kids, siblings, whatever it may be. <clears throat> you make them understand that they matter, that, that they matter, that they make a difference, that they are enough, that they don't have to be perfect. Not that you can't strive for it, but that, it's not, it, that your love for them or your acceptance for them is unconditional. I think that's a big thing. Now, I'm big on goals and I'm big on life mission statements. I wrote mine April 17th, 2005. And it's right there, but I, wanted, I, wanted, I always end with this because I, I think it's, it's important for me. Uh, this is my fulfill, fulfillment. I will inspire everyone to identify and appreciate people and values in life. I will demonstrate to all that it's okay to be vulnerable and it's actually power that helps break down obstacles in life. Real people aren't perfect. I will allow all the ability to not only see, but know me. I will touch people positively long after I've left this earth, and I will help all realize that they are not defined by what job they may have, but by the emotions they may stir. Ultimately, when I came here today, it was that last one that I was really focused on. I want to stir emotions in you so that you can then go out and stir emotions in others. Because when you stir them, and you stir them in the right way, <coughs> success is unlimited. The potential is unlimited. And I think it makes all the difference in the world. This is my fulfillment. For the longest time, 47 years, I had a hard time being fulfilled with some things. I wasn't sure. Um, but there were some moments also. Uh, I was always focused on success. But I would say this, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And I made a lot of mistakes. We all do. We all will. We all continue. But if we're aware of it and we understand it, when we try to make sense of it the best we can and accept it and know that we don't have to be perfect, 
then we've truly got a chance. This is my love. This is what I like to do is get out in front of audiences and hopefully make a difference for the better. Now, we talked about gratitude a little bit, uh, a, a little bit ago as well, <clears throat> that hashtag uh, think thank you. So there's one, um, where is it? If you look in your bag also, you have this gratitude pad. I'm very big on gratitude. And basically, if you look at it, there's 52 of them, one for each week. And here's my, my other takeaway for you. Once a week, focus on that for just a few seconds and read it and think about it. And then on the back, you got the ability to write down two things. Number one, what are you grateful for? Surely you can find one thing a week that you're grateful for. And then also, what have you done for someone else? And basically, it's just trying to bring more awareness. Oh, I get the ring back too. That's awesome. It doesn't fit. <laughs> it doesn't fit. You're bringing more awareness to number one, what you're grateful for in your life. And then number two, the awareness of the fact of what can I do for others? Laces out. Can I make a difference in the life of somebody else? Can I facilitate that success? My website is kendalldegammon.com. If I've moved you in any way or if you have any questions or anything, there's a contact submission form page on there. If you email me, I will get back with you within 24 hours and I will answer whatever question you have and you'll get my phone number. And if it's, if it's, it's an issue, if there's anything you want to talk about, I will be there. And if you, if you may be thinking, well, you know what? Boy, he talks to a lot of pe uh, people this, uh, this year and, and that must be crazy. At times it has been. At times I don't get a lot. But the fact is, somebody's got to take time. And if I don't set the example, then nobody will. But the fact is, I know a lot about you all here anyhow and what I've read. And, and I know uh, that you've got a lot of good things going on. But I just want to make sure that you know that that's available. I truly thank you and honor you for being here. Because I know this is, this is kind of an organized thing. But you all are smart people. You could have come up with an excuse if you didn't want to be here. Uh, I, I truly believe that. So I want to tell you thank you. Now, I didn't, I didn't ask this beforehand, which is I want, to have, I want to have a little more fun before we end up with this, uh, which is who all is Chiefs fans here? Quite a few Chiefs fans? Okay, we're, we're going to have some fun with that in a minute. But I'll, I'll, I'll ask one other thing. I've written a book. It's called Game Plan. Um, here, in the, here in a little bit, uh, to the gentlemen who are uh, recording this so that you all or th th this organization has a copy if they want, and I'd like to have a copy. Um, if there's anything I did that moved you or you think was good or that I could do better, anything, if you would be as kind, uh, I'd humbly ask you to go back and, and just say a few words into the camera uh, so we can record that. And I know I might use it on my website or I'll just look at it, but I just want to know how I can get better and how I can do things. And, and if you're willing to do that, I'll have a free book for you back there as well. So uh, with that, um, I thank you for your time. Paula, I thank you for having me, me, me there. You all were a wonderful a audience. And uh, you know what? Lace is out. Thanks again. Oh. I'm, I'm going to do one more thing. I, I apologize. OK, so does, does anybody watch the Chiefs and, and, and um, you know, after the game when Coach Reed comes into the locker room and he says, how about those? And what, are the, what do they yell? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, I, I want this on video in here because uh, I, I want to have a little fun with social media. We can put this out there. We'll see what the Chiefs do with it. But I'm going to say, how about those? And I want everybody to be like, Chiefs, okay? We good with that? Do we have to practice or we can get it the first time? All right, people, how about those? Chiefs! That was nice. Thank you again. I appreciate it. <laughs>